invites our speaker, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, to the audience. Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal is the principal economic advisor to Government of India and co-chair of G20's Framework Working Group. An internationally acclaimed economist and best-selling author, he spent two decades in the financial sector and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank till 2015. He was named Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum in 2010. He is also a well-known environmentalist and urban theorist. In 2007, he was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship for his work on urban dynamics. He has been a visiting scholar at Oxford University, adjunct fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies, Singapore, and a senior fellow of the World Wide Fund for Nature. He has also served on the Future City Subcommittee of the Singapore Government, tasked with building a long-term vision for the city-state. Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal attended Sriram College of Commerce, Delhi, and Oxford University, where he was a Rhodes Scholar, 1992-95. His best-selling books include Land of the Seven Rivers, The Indian Renaissance, and The Ocean of Churn, all published by Penguin. In addition, he has published around 200 articles, columns, and reports in leading national and international publications. He has been a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, London, and a visiting fellow of IDFC Institute, Mumbai. Now I request Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal to deliver the memorial lecture. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. State Bank of India Chairman Sri Rajneesh Kumarji, or more appropriately for the occasion, President of IIBF Governing Council, um, Dr. J. N. Mishra, CEO of IIBF, ladies and gentlemen, and many friends uh, that I can see in the audience. It is indeed an honor to deliver the R.K. Talwar Memorial Lecture. The late Rajkumar Talwar is one of the most distinguished bankers in the history of independent India. He was born in 1922 and joined the Imperial Bank of India in Lahore in November 1943 as a probationary assistant. He would rise through the ranks to head the institution now known as State Bank of India in 1969. So this is the 10th lecture and this is also the 50th anniversary of him becoming the chairman of uh, SBI. Now as chairman of State Bank of India, he managed India's largest bank during particularly turbulent times. And I'm sure he would have thought a lot and had a lot to say about the issues that I'm going to highlight in this lecture. In particular, he would have wondered about the problem of navigating through the fluid uncertainty of a world buffeted by unpredictable shocks, unintended consequences, butterfly effects, and unknowable interlinkages. Note, therefore, that this lecture is about how to deal with unknown unknowns and known unknowables. As we shall see, it's a very different from the problem of dealing with known and quantifiable risks, which is usually the business of many of these regulations, Basel norms, and so on. As Frank Knight, a very famous economist, put it, uncertainty must be taken in a sense radically distinct from the familiar notion of risk, from which it is never properly separated. He said this about 100 years ago, and to this day, unfortunately, neither economists nor regulators or policymakers are able to properly distinguish between risk and uncertainty. So this lecture is about how policies and regulations for dealing with uncertainty are fundamentally different from those required for dealing with risk. Now, the issue of dealing with financial sector vulnerabilities has been a long theme uh, and a central theme in economic policy making. The panics and bank failures and financial crises of the 19th and 20th century led to the evolution of key institutions such as central banks, 
as well as large body of regulations and policies meant to avert and mitigate the impact of financial system breakdowns. Although central banks, finance ministries, and international organizations did learn much from each other, most of the regulatory and policy frameworks were basically national till the 1980s. So, in 1988, an internationally accepted framework was adopted that demanded some minimum standards be met by banks instead of the patchwork of national regulatory frameworks. Now known as Basel I, it introduced the concept of regulatory capital that is aligned to a ba bank's balance sheet, which is capital to risk weight weighted asset ratio, CRAR. Many of you are bankers. In fact, all of, almost all of you are, so you'll be familiar with the idea. Now, this approach was further enhanced by Basel II norms introduced in 2004 that demanded greater granulation of risks faced by banks' balance sheets. Capital charges were made for credit risk, market risk, operational risk, and so on. However, the global financial crisis of 2007-8 exposed the in inadequacies of this approach. So, in response, a new and more demanding set of norms was adopted in 2010. Known as Basel III, most of these capital requirements have been implemented in phases in India since April 2013, and they have been rolled out similarly in other parts of the world as well. Now, Basel III did not merely introduce more stringent quality and quantity requirements for the regulatory capital. It made certain innovations as well. For instance, it introduced an additional layer of common equity, the capital conservation buffer, as well as introduced a leverage ratio that required banks to have a minimum level of loss absorbing capital relative to all of the bank's assets irrespective of risk weights. Similarly, another innovation was to take into account system-wide risks, known as macroprudential norms, or what economists prefer to call macro proof. Basel III imposed additional requirements on systemically important banks as well as a counter-cyclical capital buffer that is meant to balance out credit cycles. Although the last uh, 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 thing has not been exactly been tested, so it's still work in progress. So it is fair to say that the rolling out of Basel III norms have led to a more systematic approach to risk taking by banks internationally and have forced them to become better capitalized. In India, the rolling out of Basel III norms since uh, 2013 uh, in a phased manner has coincided also with the introduction of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code in 2016, as well as the imposition of much more stringent asset quality recognition. All of us have suffered through this, so I don't have to tell you much about this. While these changes did cause disruptions in the wider economy, the Indian banking system is arguably healthier today than it was at the beginning of the decade. This audience will be familiar with the story thus far, and I'm now going to wade into much more trickier issues. It may not be obvious, but the general philosophical basis of Basel approach is that risks faced by banks are generally known, or at least quantifiable. This is why it prescriptively assigns risk weights to classes of assets. As pointed out by Anat Admati and Martin Helwig, both of them very well-known scholars in the field, the system of risk weights we currently have has more to do with politics and tradition than with science. That's their words. For instance, home country sovereign debt enjoys zero risk weight. But the Greek default of 2012 demonstrated clearly the flaw in this line of thinking. Even when Basel III allows for external assessment of risk, it presumes that it is only a matter of encouraging credit analysts and rating agencies to work out the probability of default. The belief, therefore, is that it is mostly a matter of adequately incentivizing rating agencies to delve ever deeply into balance sheets and create even more elaborate Excel sheet models. The basic idea being, if they are properly incentivized, the analysts will keep digging and digging and digging 
and then they'll really know what the risks really are. The problem is that financial systems are not merely subject to known and quantifiable risks, but to more to pure uncertainty of unknown unknowns and known unknowables. So what are these? The former, by unknown unknowns, derives from the geopolitical, political, technological, economic, and other shocks, which <coughs> Chairman SBI was just mentioning earlier, that simply cannot be predicted or quantified in any meaningful way. The latter, which is the unknown unknowables, relates to factors that cannot be resolved, even though you know they are there, because of inherent information gaps and asymmetries. For instance, moral hazard problem of monitoring management behavior. We know it's a problem, but we can't really get around it by ever more asking for ever more information. Moreover, note that all the above factors I just mentioned interact with each other in multiple ways and very nonlinear ways. So therefore, the second and third order feedback loops result in very complicated, unpredictable evolution of outcomes. So what we have is financial systems that are complex, adaptive systems that are constantly evolving in an unpredictable world. This is just as much a world, therefore, of indeterminable uncertainty as of quantifiable risk. The introduction of rigid and prescriptive regulations aimed only at risks, therefore, is not merely adequate, but may, be harm may have harmful unintended consequences from an uncertainty management perspective. For instance, one can argue that the sudden growth of shadow banking across the world is partly due to the imposition of stricter norms on banks. The result is that financial sector vulnerability has simply shifted off to the unregulated part of the system. This is not to argue that Basel III should be rolled back, but to point out that the current approach has serious limits. Rather than stumble into ever more stringent regulations, perhaps the time has come to take a wider view of the matter. So here are a following list of some of the issues that need to be considered. Issue number one, supervision versus regulation. There has been a tendency to treat regulation and supervision as being broadly the same thing, or at least being substitutes in some way. However, there is a big difference between the rule-bound approach of regulation and the business of active supervision. In a fluid and unpredictable world, we need to take the latter, which is supervision, much more seriously. Yet, the emphasis worldwide has been almost entirely on regulation, even though the norms, the Basel norms, were set up by a group ironically called the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. For instance, almost all the banking sector scandals in India of the last few years, not all, but almost all, were due to failures of supervision and not due to lack of regulations. Even more regulation would not have averted most of the problems. One could argue, of course, that we need more of both, but we need to be careful here. There will always be limited resources, and we do need to think about trade-offs. Indeed, even more regulations can shift attention to mindless box-ticking and make the financial system rigid and opaque. Perhaps the time has come to discuss the institutional capacity and the incentives of regulators than the imposition of ever more stringent rules. This realization is finally dawning on the Basel Committee, and it has issued a list of core principles for effective banking supervision. My own reading of the current formulation of these supervision principles is that they are just too general to be effective. But at least it's a beginning. Issue number two, the role of rating agencies. Now, one of the results of banking of this Basel approach has been to make credit rating agencies by, by credit ratings by rating agencies a part of the regulatory framework. Before this, they were merely educated opinions that could be used as an input for investment decisions. The change has not gone unnoticed. But most of the criticism 
has focused on repeated failure of rating agencies to predict credit events and the consequent need for aligning incentives. Perhaps the real problem is that we are taking the forecasting abilities of rating agencies too seriously. Are we the victims of what the famous economist Frederick von Hayek termed the pretense of knowledge? Perhaps we should recognize that the rating agencies have only limited capability of predicting the future course of outcomes. Hardwiring risk weights and, rating and credit ratings is not just lending, leading to false quantification of unknown unknowns, but unnecessarily inserting a self-reinforcing feedback loop where a change in credit rating influences the credit, rating, uh, credit event itself. No amount of fixing the incentives of rating agencies will solve this. This is not to argue that rating agencies cannot play a useful role in quantifying risk or that the incentive stru structures do not need to be realigned, but merely pointing out their limitations when dealing with uncertainty. Issue number three, genetic diversity. Closely related to the above problem, is that of genetic diversity in the ways banks manage risk. Banks used to be allowed to manage their own risks, managed on their own inter internal assessments and models. In fact, as we just heard, till the 80s, they pretty much did their own thing. It was found that this, in many cases, led to gaming, or if you prefer the euphemism, optimization of the system. And therefore, standardized models were introduced. Now, this may be a good thing for discouraging gaming, although, of course, standardized models can also be optimized. But worryingly, however, all banks around the world now manage their risk in roughly the same way. In an unpredictable world buffeted by what Nassim Taleb calls black swans, it's only a matter of time before the global financial system is hit by a shock that was not anticipated by these standardized models. Lacking diversity, many parts of the financial system will fail at exactly the same time. This is akin to what happens when an epidemic hits a biological system lacking genetic diversity. There is some evidence that the widespread use of similar value at risk models or VAR models had contributed to the global financial crisis in 2008 by encouraging a form of herd behavior. In other words, what may be a good thing for managing risk may be poor for the problem of managing uncertainty. Problem number four, risk shifting and shadow banking. One of the unintended consequences of the imposition of stricter regulations and capital requirements on banks has been the explosive expansion of shadow banks. This is a global phenomenon and has taken many different forms in different parts of the world. In India, of course, it translated into the rapid growth of non-banking finance companies or NBFCs. It is quite clear that we need to impose some regulation and transparency on NBFCs but let us also be aware of the trade-off. This is a particularly hot topic, as you know. If we impose ever heavier bank-type regulations on existing NBFCs, we will either be shutting off capital availability to a significant part of the economy, or we will be shifting systemic risk to yet another part of the financial system. By chasing risk taking into ever more regu ever less regulated and non transparent recesses of the financial system, we are effectively converting risk into uncertainty. There is no easy solution to this, to this wider problem, and only an intelligent regulatory trained off combined with flexible and active supervision can be made to work. Problem number five. Skin in the game. The previous points all were about unknown unknowns. However, there is also the issue of known unknowables, particularly those related to moral hazard and irresponsible behavior. This can apply to management as well as shareholders and many other players in the financial system.
<clears throat> this can apply. Uh, the problem here arises because a lot of actions of key financial system players is not directly observable. And given the inherent riskiness and uncertainty of outcomes, it is not easy to hold players accountable. One way to circumvent this problem is to ensure decision makers have what is called skin in the game. This can be introduced at multiple levels in order to ensure alignment of incentives. One area that has attracted a lot of attention since the global financial crisis of 2008, globally of course, is management compensation. You will all be conversant with all the debates over variable compensation, clawbacks, delayed encashment, and so on. In the first week of November, RBI issued new guidelines for private bank CEO remuneration. However, the same skin in the game argument can apply to shareholders. Scholars like Professor Anat Admati of Stanford have often argued that capital requirement should just focus on equity capital base and leverage, as this is what really represents the true loss absorption capacity of a bank. One could equally argue that having more equity at stake would make shareholders much more cautious and long-term oriented. Issue number six, board of directors and corporate governance. The problem of moral hazard, unknowables, and uncertainty brings us to the gamut of old-fashioned solutions, which are corporate governance, the culture of compliance, and the role of the board of governors, issues that <coughs> Chairman SBI alluded to earlier, but is, of course, particularly pertinent to today because this is the Talwar Memorial Lecture, and, of course, um, R.K. Tarwar was very famous for his integrity and taking all these old-fashioned solutions particularly seriously. As RBI Deputy Governor M.K. Jain recently said in a lecture, sound corporate governance and compliance culture will permit the supervisor to place more reliance on the bank's internal processes. In this regard, supervisory experience underscores the importance of having appropriate levels of authority, responsibility, accountability, and checks and balances within each bank. I've directly quoted him, as I could not have put it more succinctly. Let me add that the board of directors of a bank, or any corporate institution for that matter, is the first line of defense. Sadly, it is just not taken seriously enough in India, especially the role of independent directors. Do we? need more stringent regulation, regulation of directorships, perhaps to an extent. But simply using the stick will not work here, as it will merely discourage good quality people from participating. We need to have a serious national debate on how to attract talent to corporate boards, including those of banks, and to provide appropriate incentives for doing it. Simply having more and more sticks and regulations of this is not going to work. Issue number seven, insolvency, contract enforcement, and dispute resolution. All the above issues relate to ex ante ways of dealing with the problem of uncertainty. However, even with the best management systems, things will inevitably go wrong. Therefore. Ex post resolution and recovery is critical. In an uncertain world, no amount of ex ante risk analysis and management can compensate for this. The introduction of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code in 2016 and its implementation in 27, from, uh, since 2017 are important steps in this direction. Nonetheless, India continues to perform poorly in contract enforcement and dispute resolution. With some 35 million cases, the legal system is clogged. The World Bank's ease of doing business rankings promoted India from 142 in 2014 to 63 in 2019. Well done. However, note, the sub-ranking 
for contract enforcement places India at 163rd place out of 190 countries. Most of the countries below us are essentially dysfunctional or at war. It can, it can be argued that this is now the single biggest constraint to India's economic and financial health. The way in which we currently try to circumvent this problem is by making ever more complex regulations and contracts. However, as we know from the work on incomplete contracts by economists like Oliver Hart, that in a world of uncertainty, it is impossible to write com complete contracts and by extension regulations for every future contingency. Thus, we are fruitlessly adding ex ante complexity in order to solve for failures of ex post resolution and enforcement. The above list is neither exhaustive nor are the issues unique to India, although some may be more important here in India and in our context than in other places. The idea was here to briefly illustrate how the framework for thinking about uncertainty is radically different than that for thinking about risk. In this lecture, I have applied the framework exclusively to the issue of managing the financial sector and the limitations of, Bas of the Basel-type approach. But this line of thought, based on complexity theory, can be applied to fields as diverse as urban design and industrial strategy. Since we live in a world that is complex, evolving, non-deterministic, and unpredictable, we cannot make policies and regulations that make a pretense of knowledge. This, there, simply, there is simply no escape from active management and supervision, from skin in the game, from ex post resolution, and most importantly, old fashioned values such as integrity and corporate culture. I end with that because, as I said, that would be, be, be the appropriate place to end the Talwar Memorial Lecture. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think in some ways this goes to the crux of the point I was making in my lecture is that the world is not just about risk, it's also about uncertainty, it's about problems with corporate governance and so on. And no amount of this uh, mechanical, you know, uh, uh, approach of uh, putting risk weights and so on can solve this problem. You are solving the wrong problem. I mean, there is some, some benefit from doing all this analysis, but that only can at best solve the risk part of the problem. It cannot get involved in the uncertainty part. And so, as I said, you know, even if you had the best models, even if you incentivized all the analysts in the best possible way, this simply will not be able to solve this. So rather than trying to dig ever deeper down this path, We've got to understand that there is a limit to this line of this approach. And therefore, while we do need to clean up our act on that front, I do want to say that there, there is a limit to it and that the next range of things we need to do relate to the things I laid out, uh, whether it is in terms of, as I said, corporate, bank, uh, corporate governance, values, etc. on one side, but things like ex post resolution. I mean, no matter what happens, some of it is going to go wrong. We need to have a smooth way of resolving things after they go wrong. Um, we cannot ha uh, expect that, oh my, you know, having this great model is going to solve anything. 
And by the way, this is, I keep, I have, I've given this lecture because this is the context in, uh, uh, in terms of Basel and regulation for banks. This is true for everything. Uh, this is true of urban design. Uh, one of the major flaws in the why since independence we have still not been able to build one single great city in India and we still rely upon cities built uh, in British era, era or even before that is because we have in our heads this idea of uh, master planned cities. But master plans by definition cannot deal with uncertainty and evolution and consequently we build these completely dysfunctional cities over and over again. The point is the whole, it's about managing Gurgaon better, it's not about building more Chandigars. I started out, you know, state, from state uh, with the Rajneesh, you know, as a probationary officer in 1980. Then I moved to various other areas in uh, finance, uh, investment banking and all. Uh, I have a question, you know. Uh, first, I would like to say that, you know, you have dealt with this uh, problem very well. But uh, one thing, you know, which you said, you know, about skill in the game. Now, Reserve Bank of India has come out with a regu uh, regulation or suggestion, you know, for private sector banks. What about the PSDs, public sector banks? Do you have any solution? I think ultimately skin in the game is an important issue. I'm sure uh, <coughs> Rajneesh has many opinions on the matter. But it is the case that you do need to have some form of skin in the game at multiple levels. The, if Without skin in the game, the incentive structures will not be aligned. Now, of course, in a private sector environment, it's obvious how to go about it. In a public center environment where the objectives are not necessarily purely um, monetary, so to say, they may be social objectives, etc. It is a much trickier thing to do. So the philosophical problem is absolutely right. The solutions to it, as I said, are trickier. But even there, there is a private element to the compensation and uh, that needs to be aligned. This point was, uh, yes. Excessive compensation is a risk, and so is the risk with the bidders. That's what is <laughs> Well, clearly your, uh, your 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 colleagues have a have a have a strong opinion on how you are being compensated. <laughs> Sir, uh, you made a I'm not excited for the CFD CFD idea. Uh, you did uh, recognize that we are in the over enriched environment. And unfortunately, despite having plethora of information and market intelligence, the risk aversion is dominant over taking the informed risk, which is the business or dharma of the virus. Your views. Well, this is again something maybe Rajini should really deal with, but I will say, I think after a significant period of cleaning up, recapitalization, etc., etc., the public sector banks, I could argue, are now have fair amount of liquidity and resources to get back to the real business of taking risk and lending. I think it takes some time for the ship to turn. After all, uh, there was a fair amount of uh, pain taken in terms of the amount of cleaning up that was done, the culture change, insolvency, writing down, and so on. And, uh, let's not uh, um, you know brush under the carpet the fact that it was a major, major cultural shock. And I think now that we are on the other side of having adjusted through this, um, and now we are back to an environment where there are indeed uh, you know, resources with not just public sector banks, but banks in general, uh, I'm sure uh, the banking uh, world, including many of you, will rise to the occasion and supply capital to an economy that really does need capital. Hello, sir. I'm uh, Jay Gokhale, I'm ex-investment banker. You have spoken about uh, the institution of uh, independent directors and uh, you said that the national debate is essential on the subject. What are your own restrictions for making the institution of independent directors more effective and sound? Well, that will be have to be the next lecture that I give. Uh, <laughs> it's a fairly, as I said, it's a fairly large topic. But I do think that we have um, historically simply not taken it seriously. Um, I think 
uh, whether it is in terms of uh, tra providing training and human capital uh, uh, in that, and I think in that uh, there is some effort being made by MCA uh, in terms of providing a, a standardized uh, testing and uh, training for this group, uh, which uh, hopefully we will roll out uh, in not, not too distant future. Uh, but we also need to begin to think about how independent directors are meant to be compensated, uh, the kinds of risks they take, what is their skin in the game, uh, and so on. I think we need to, as I said, we need a debate on this issue. Uh, other countries have, by the way, found other ways of uh, solving for this problem. This is not, not at all a unique problem to India. So there is a case here to look to other countries, look at their experiences. In fact, the board of directors is a very old institution now. I mean. The East India Company used to have an, uh, you know, a board of directors in the 18th century, so this is not a new thing. There's plenty of uh, uh, international and national uh, experience to, deal, uh, to draw from. But I think the point here is we do need to take this seriously. I don't think independent directors as a part of our corporate culture were thought to be a particularly in important part of our corporate life till essentially now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just so that we, I'll take one more question after this as well. Yeah. So then, yeah. Uh, there is no question that we have, uh, you know, various schemes that need to be looked at, and the question is, in many many cases, and I won't name them because uh, many of them end to end up getting politically uh, very charged. But the fact is that there are uh, various Ponzi schemes that do pop up from time to time. We do need, again, uh, to keep alert, and regulators do need to keep alert, policymakers do need to keep alert. Again, in many cases, they simply operate, uh, the, some of the worst ones, simply operate outside of the zone of regulation. So having more regulation doesn't matter because they're operating outside the universe of regulation. So consequently, the point is, first of all, we need to be clear what those regulations are. But again, I keep coming back to the point that supervision, i.e. actively monitoring the problem, the, the financial world, is the need of the R. Adding more regulations is not the problem. Well, there clearly we have regulators who are supposed to be doing this. We, and for the financial world, we do have SEBI, RBI, and several others whose job it is to do it. And of course, the finance ministries, both at the central and the state level, um, we have enforcement directorates of, uh, and, and other uh, law enforcement and agencies. So there, it's not the lack of agencies. No, so, so we do need to pay much more attention to this. There is no doubt about it. Yes. This will literally have to be the last one, because my throat will give up after this. OK, so sorry. There's a gentleman. I'll take your question as well. Since there are two of you, I shall take it together, and then we can. Uh, Somna Dori from FIS. Uh, I'm a fr payments and fraud uh, technology consultant for banks. And uh, 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 what I perceive is uh, today, RBI have a lot of reporting mechanisms for uh, banks to report the frauds that has happened. But do you think with a changing technology like the big data, artificial intelligence, there's a possibility of uh, getting, can RBI getting connected with the bank system and uh, uh, pull out, uh, you know, their fraud analytics okay. scoring it. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. And can, can you give it to the gentleman in front? Then he can also ask, I'll answer them together. Yeah, I'm just going to do the group. When we talk about uncertainty, the cockpit started adopting this concept of scenario planning, looking at four or five scenarios. I think uh, that we started in planning commission also in the last uh, plan. We looked at three, four scenarios. Maybe that is one of the things which uh, in the bank's kind of So I think, uh, let me just uh, answer uh, them together. I think there is an issue here that you need to be careful. See, very often, whenever new technology is now, the new one is taking analytics, artificial intelligence, and so on. And we begin to apply the, uh, them to the huge amount of data that is available. 
There is no doubt that whether it is the banks, the regulators, whether RBI or finance ministry can benefit from taking the data and using analytics, AI, etc., to look for patterns, etc., which are helpful. But this is exactly what my talk is about. No matter how good that is, it is really still dealing with risk. It cannot deal with uncertainty because the analytics that you are talking about is really about getting models better and better at dealing with pre-existing patterns, that is risk, i.e. places where there are quantifiability is there. And so while we do need to do that better, we need to be very, very careful that we do not promise too much from the new technologies. No matter how good the AI is, it cannot deal with uncertainty by definition. These are unknown unknowns or unknowables. And you can have the best technology in the world, the best analytics. It still cannot substitute for dealing with the actual flexible supervision, monitoring, and human judgment that will always be needed, at least from the level of technology we can think about. And so this is why I wanted to make this distinction between risk and uncertainty. People tend to confuse the two, and many of the problems we have comes from confusing these two. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.